Hello and welcome to another episode of the Startup Planner. Today we're going to be talking about patents and protecting your intellectual property in your in your new, new startup organization. This is an interesting topic and something that, that a lot of new startup entrepreneurs are, are concerned about and worried about. And if you've got a great idea, you don't want anyone to steal that idea. So how do you protect it? How do you take care of your company? Join us shortly as we begin the Startup Planner. Welcome back to another episode. It's good to see you, my friend. <laughs> it's nice to see you again, too. It's, uh, it, was, it was nice being able to actually uh, uh, meet you and do these things in person, but we're back to uh, back to doing these things long distance now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very unfortunate. That, there was a, um, a lot of energy and it was a lot of fun to actually sit down and interview some folks and get to do this in person. So um, if you didn't get to see, if, if you're tuned in and you didn't get to see some of our episodes, we strongly encourage you to go back and and watch the ones we've published. We interviewed some fantastic entrepreneurs who have gone through, uh, in in some cases, numerous startup companies, and they shared some of the some of their challenges and some of their uh, some of the things that that you know kept them up at night, but also some of the things that, that have made it so successful for them and why they love doing it. So today we're going to be talking about patents, and really this is one of those core pieces. I mean, if you have an idea. That's what this is all about. How do you take an idea and turn it into something special? So as we begin today, um, we're going to talk a lot about things like NDAs and patents. And I really want to come back and I'm going to tee you up here, here, Drews. We are not lawyers. Oh, no, yeah. Yeah. We don't even play them on TV as, uh, as the old cliche goes. But yeah, this is this is really one of those circumstances where that really comes into play because you know getting you know non-disclosures all the all the things that uh, that go along with uh, doing intellectual property protection this is a legal issue so having a good law you know law firm behind you having somebody who actually knows what they're doing is vitally important all right so let's jump in so one of the first things as a new startup company that you're going to have you've got your idea and, and when in the early episodes, we talked a lot about how to protect that from a most basic level. And I know one of the one of the important parts is is it's important to get a patent. If you've got a product that's actually patentable and that's really hard to say, um, you know, that's that's your first step. So, so Drew, I know you've been doing a little bit of work and you, you've actually talked with some companies about these kind of things in, in the recent uh, recent times. So Let, let's start off with patents in general and patents are are one way of being able to protect your intellectual property. Uh, and there's some, some benchmarks of what is actually patentable and we'll go into those things. But you know, one of the other ones is you know, just the normal trade secret. And, and so if you've got something that is core to the way that your product works and uh, it's important to it, but it's not necessarily patentable for whatever reason, uh, you can still protect it from a standpoint of making it a trade secret. Unfortunately, as a trade secret, it means that you can't go around using it as a competitive differentiator when you talk to people about it because then it's no longer secret. So, but the it other side like, is, is the actual patent. And that would be like Kentucky Fried Chicken's secret sauce, right? Yeah, ex exactly. We have a trade secret for the 11 herbs and spices, and here they are. It's just like, it's not, uh, it doesn't quite work out that well. From a, from a patent standpoint, that's the other more common way that people like to think about protecting their intellectual property. So the three main tenets of whether or not you can patent something go as follows. You know, number one is, you know, there can't be prior art. You can't take something that you've already seen out there and then turn around and, uh, and patent that, you know, like that's, that's forbidden. So you really need to go out and do what they call a patent search to you know, make sure that nothing exists. You're not trying to patent something that somebody else has come up with. The next thing is, is it's got to be demonstrable. I can't make something up in my head and and just you know like I have. I'm going to patent a time machine. If you can't show how the time machine would work, then you can't patent it. Doesn't necessarily you have to work yet, but you have to show how it would work. It's actually got to be uh, a functional idea. And then the third thing, and this is actually one of the places where it gets a little bit murky, uh, is it's got to be what they call non-obvious. So non-obvious means that, you know, if anybody looking at the problem was like, oh yeah, you just solve it like this, 
you know, that would be considered to be obvious. So you've got to have something that is a unique take on a solution to an actual problem. And that, that you know, non-obvious aspect has to be in play. Now, having said that, there may be some things out there that you would consider to be obvious uh, that may not be. And, and I'll give you an example. Uh, Amazon very, very famously a few years back patented the single click uh, checkout, you know, like your one button you know, and you and you bought it. And to anybody looking at this, you're like, well, that's 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 pretty darn obvious here. How how difficult it was it for them to think of you know, like you need a button. Now, that's not you know, even though that that was kind of like the title of it, that's not really what they were patenting. What they were patenting were all of the processes behind the button, things that get kicked off as a result of you clicking the button and pulling in things and making sure that you are who you say you are and making sure that, uh, you know, all the things that, that got involved as a result of you clicking that button, that process is actually what they ended up patenting. Uh, and that was non-obvious. Now I'm certain that we need a button to go with our Rolodex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> something that that something that I've also seen trick up, trip up companies and entrepreneurs in the past, and th this is uh, maybe a sore spot for some folks. And it's also something you you do see on TV frequently in, in a lot of the legal type shows. Uh, you have to be very careful if you are working for a company today and you develop something while working for that company. You may think it's your idea, but most employment contracts. <laughs> state that anything developed while on company time becomes their intellectual property. So that does not give you the right to take it out and, and start a company. Now, good companies, depending upon the culture and where you work with, may give you that right and may even help fund your startup. So there's a whole nother path you know, to spinning out a company from a great idea that might give you that, that option. Um, but just be aware that, that, you know, if you've developed a great idea and, and changed the world where you work today, yeah. unfortunately, it's not your idea. It's the idea of the company you work for. So, um, you know, that, yeah, that's if, probably step if, number four in the patentability clause. Yeah. Yeah. If you are, if you're currently working for another large company uh, and, you know, you're lying awake at night and you come up with that really brilliant idea, do not work on it on company equipment do not work on it on company time don't have any paper trail whatsoever keep that idea in your head <laughs> don't talk to anybody at work about it you know like it, uh, it is it's really important that you can show that there's zero you know, there's zero overlap between company resources and everything and that idea if you decide to quit later on and start up that company you know make sure that you're you're working on that you know like after after it's very clear that everything is uh has been severed between yourself and that organization because that that's the worst thing in the world is is for you to come up come up with something work really hard on it and then have your company that you used to work for come back and say no nah, that actually belongs to us now so yeah. be careful don't use company resources to work on something that you're going to be doing on your own uh later on down the road Drews, I suspect this concept probably comes up more often than not because usually it's at work that we have our great ideas. I mean, you're doing you're doing some task at work and, and it crosses your mind. I could make this easier. And, and then, you know, 10 minutes after it's too late, you've already told somebody and it's the company's idea. You're like, I could have started a company to make that or to do that. So, I, you know, that's probably a great topic for a whole show in the near future is just yeah. how to protect yourself when you've got a great idea at work. So uh, we'll, we'll keep that one in the books. Um, the next big topic yeah, is, is a non-disclosure. <laughs> and uh, if you, probably everyone on this call, everyone listening has, has had to sign a non-disclosure at some point. If you work for a decent sized company, there's some form of employment contract. There's some form of NDA clause in those. Uh, if you talk with other companies, other partners, chances are your company has a company-wide NDA that protects their intellectual property and your intellectual property from each other. Uh, it's just part of the way business is done to help protect to protect the, the aspects of our business. So when it comes to NDA on a more personal level as you're starting a company, there's a few key aspects there too. And, and Drews, I know um, you and I both deal with companies on a regular basis. Before we get into this, a couple of the key notes, which, which I'll let you cover, are the things like, while we know it's a little hard to enforce an NDA 
you know, it's, it's difficult, not impossible, but it can be difficult. The genuine business world, the, the, the real business folks out there actually consider that to be kind of holy ground. The NDA, if, if I don't respect yours, you're not going to respect mine and the whole process breaks down. So there is a level of trust and a level of professional business ethics that falls behind the NDA as well. But I know you've had to deal with some of that in, in your life. And there's a couple of key things here that are, are hot topics around NDA that I think are important that, that, that our listeners include in their, in their thought process. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of funny because uh, NDAs get a bit of a bad rap because of exactly what you mentioned, that, uh, uh, that they're technically not all that enforceable. It's really difficult to, uh, um, you know, to, to actually go through that effort, especially in a circumstance where you've got a small company going against a larger company that's got very deep pockets and uh, they've got attorneys with, uh, with thick Rolodexes and <laughs> et cetera. But, when I wanted to hit this before we close out. You know, a patent obviously protects your idea from the world. An NDA doesn't. An NDA protects your idea and, and ask the, the parties that you're doing business with to hold that in respect and to protect it. Um, where all are the places you've seen NDA use? I mean, obviously, as we work with startup companies, um, you know, we, we sign NDAs with those startup companies to protect their, to, to hold their intellectual property sacred, to not share it, to not use it, to not take it into our own product, those kind of things. Um, but I know we, yeah. we've talked through all kinds of aspects in this, in this series. Where are some of the other big areas to use an NDA? Basically, you want to use an NDA anytime that, uh, you know, this is, this is my rule of thumb. You know, I want to use an NDA or a mutual NDA anytime I'm going to be talking about something that the company or the party that I'm talking to can't just go onto my website and find out themselves. You know, if it's, if it's that public that it's on my website, I can talk about it without an NDA. Anything beyond that, you should be thinking having an NDA just to protect yourself. That, that's the point where, you know, and it's just a good habit to get into just to make sure because you, you get to talking uh, to organizations and you, and you kind of forget that this might be a little bit sensitive for that. Like it's, it's better just to err on the side of caution. And, and it's such a common practice that, you know, nobody's going to refuse to talk to you because you're not doing that. It, when you're starting off and you're, you've got a startup out there, we all have a tendency of, of wanting to err on the side of being very cautious about what you, what you talk about. And the reality is you go back to what I was talking about, about what, constitutes something that's patentable. It's got to be, you know, uh, you know, no prior art. It's got to be uh, um, demonstrable and then non-obvious. Well, you know, the level of obviousness is pretty common. Um, you know, and if you come up with the idea, you need to at least entertain the fact that, you know, other people might have that idea as well. And really what it comes down to is it's not a matter of jealously protecting your, your, your information as much as it is that you've got this idea now, I need to out execute everybody. If you're out executing people, it doesn't matter what information that you've given them. Now, having said that, if you're like one guy, one developer, and you're going in and talking to some Fortune 500 company, they might have the ability to out execute you and you have to be cautious of that. But in general, the best protection for your intellectual property is to execute quickly. So today we talked about patents, we've talked about non-disclosures, Really, the, the concept is how do you protect your intellectual property? And we hope this has been helpful. As a quick reminder, Drews and I are not lawyers. We, we are not sharing legal advice here. Our goal is just to give you some ideas and, and hopefully and helpfully ensure that you are taking the steps to, to protect yourself and your company. So please, in your startup, make sure you're engaging uh, appro appropriate legal services to cover all your legal bases. Um, We've covered a lot of topics today. If you've seen some of these, we'd love to hear from you. If you have any thoughts on how maybe the difficulty of, of going through a patent process, or if you've ever been involved in a real struggle around an NDA, drop us a note. We'd love to hear. Subscribe to the podcast, uh, share with your friends, and we look forward to hearing you again on the Startup Planner. Thanks for joining. Mm -hmm.